You guys have all seen the news lately. I'm sure you probably you probably read about this in the news that uh, corduroy pillows are making headlines. Um, well, I mean, I used to work I used to work at a blanket factory, but it folded, so I don't know very good jokes. <sighs> okay, so as we go along today, uh, if you have any questions, anything pops up in your mind, please put that in the question and answer field. Um, that will be where the Q and A will come from uh, at the end of the presentation here today. And I'll go get through as many of those questions and answers as I possibly can at the end. I don't know how long this talk is going to go. It's collated from uh, a bunch of different presentations I give that are usually 45 minutes long. I'm sure this will go at least an hour. It might go as long as 75 minutes. So um, I might get up and go get some donuts or something. <laughs> you certainly can uh, get something, get your coffee. All right, well, let's get started. For those of you who don't know me, uh, this is me. I am Benjamin Vogt. I am owner of Monarch Gardens LLC. It's a prairie-inspired design firm based out of eastern Nebraska. We work in sunny prairie-inspired landscapes as well as shady meadow-type inspired landscapes, so under mature urban trees and all that good stuff. I am the author of two books, A New Garden Ethic, Cultivating Defiant Compassion for an Uncertain Future. It is a very philosophical, deep, and dense um, psychological thriller <laughs> no no it's just it's just regular old nonfiction. think think leopold and thinkers like that i'm also author of the brand new uh, prairie up an introduction to natural garden design um, both of them are doing very well and i'm so honored that people read those and find value in those uh, my work has appeared in publications such as the american gardener dwell fine gardening guardian horticulture midwest living and wall street journal as well as lots of different books out there uh, you'll find my images in all kinds of garden books and um, interviews and podcasts all over the place so that's just a very little bit about me and if you want more dad jokes or puns at the end you let me know because that could be a fourth bullet point on this list here i love those so give me some new ones if you want to i, I definitely need some new ones well, if you guys are ready, let's get into this. There is a lot of information, a lot of content to go through here today. I've been telling folks that this is a mega presentation and it absolutely is. There is so much in here, just about everything under the sun that you can think of for this subject matter. So this is actually headquarters out here in Eastern Nebraska. And this view will probably look familiar to a lot of you who live in suburbia. Um, this is this is not necessarily what we're up against, but this is what what we have to change. So where did American lawns come from? Um, started um, way back in the post-Civil War era, um, where we started creating suburbs in the United States um, so that uh, we could have access for for streetcars. And there was a setback. Um, setback law uh, between the street and the homes. And in that space, a lot of people were growing vegetables and whatnot. So that's like the very beginning and the very broad, very broad beginning. Um, when lawns really kicked into high, high gear, what, when lawns became a thing was post-World War II baby boom and all the soldiers coming back from the war, men and women both, needed housing, right? Uh, and the front yard food plots that were so common before then and the chicken coops and all that good stuff, they gave way to manicured lawns. Um, sprawling highways and interstates helped create large landscape gaps and they had to be filled with something. And something easy to maintain, right? So between 1947 and 1951, over 17,000 homes were built in just one planned community called Levittown on Long Island, New York, a sprawling suburban development that replaced potato fields, which had themselves replaced the, the natural wild meadows that were called the Hempstead Plains there on the Long Island area. Covenants in Levittown uh, required a weekly mowing or a community crew would come and mow you for that we would mow it for you, right? And then bill you. <laughs> this should sound really familiar to a lot of us, right? We get we get letters from uh, city weed officials, county weed officials saying that if you don't do X, if you don't count, cut this back in this time frame, we're going to come do it for you and send you a bill in the mail. And this is where it came from. So here's an earlier image of Levittown. Um, that is a lot of lawn, right? Just, just a ton, uh, a lot of air pollution for sure. 
All this green on this map here represents lawn spaces, urban lawn spaces, pretty much primarily. Uh, if you put all those green blobs and dots and, and whatnot together, it equals the area uh, square square acreage of the state of Georgia. That's a very big area. So when you hear folks like Doug Ptolemy calling for a homegrown national park, this is where that idea comes from. When you start to convert these lawn landscapes to something more sustainable using native plants to support more wildlife, you're making a really big dent and a really big call to action. So these, these 63,000 square miles or so uh, take at 20 trillion gallons of water, right? That's just to irrigate the lawns, not the flower beds around them or anything. Now we use 30 trillion gallons of water just to irrigate our food crops. So think about that. Two thirds of the water we use to irrigate food crops is used to irrigate lawns. It's, it is incredibly wasteful. We have 5,000 acres per day that are being converted to lawn. Um, that number could be more, it could be less. That's just an average. Uh, you think about the Amazon rainforest, that's 10,000 acres per day we're, we're, we're losing. Uh, so this, this lawn conversion in the United States, it's an incredibly big deal. And obviously it's not just in the United States, but, but I'm coming to you from the United States. So that's what we're talking about today. So if 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 19 are linked to cancer, 13 to birth defects, 21 to reproductive disorders, 15 to brain damage. Um, I did not promise a happy talk. We'll have some lighter moments, of course. Again, dad jokes galore if you like. Um, but these are, these are serious things that we got to know about them, right? Um, if we're going to have kids playing in our lawns, what are they playing on? And our dogs. Of those 17 detected, or 17 of those are detected in groundwater, 11 are toxic to bees, and 16 are toxic to birds. And this is an older study. I can't imagine what else is new in the last 10 or 20 years after this came out. Idling a leaf blower for 10 minutes produces as much toxic exhaust as driving a large pickup truck for 235 miles. So we're talking like F-150 Chevy Silverado, so a pretty decent sized truck. Now, less than 1% of the original tall grass prairie remains, making it more threatened than the Amazon and Indonesian rainforest combines. 70% of all U.S. grasslands may be gone by 2100. Uh, we have grasslands all over the country. My wife calls me pissed off prairie guy for a good reason. I, uh, we're always driving around town and I'm annoyingly saying, why can't that business park lawn uh, be sustainable metal space? That there, it's not being used except to irrigate, fertilize and mow. That's the only purpose. Why can't it be supporting wildlife, uh, cleaning up uh, runoff and you know all the good ecosystem services we have, cleaning the air, uh, reducing stormwater runoff. So let me throw a couple of maps at you, because a lot of folks think prairie, uh, grasslands, meadow type spaces are just in one part of the country, but that's not true. So here's the central and western United States. Um, these are, this is one map, there are lots of different ones, I'm going to go with this one showing the, the extent of, of historic ranges of certain grassland ecosystems. So there's the tall grass, mixed prairie, short grass, basin steppe, Palouse grasslands up there in Washington State and Oregon and Idaho. California used to have immense grasslands. There's just uh, uh, one little speck left. It's a large speck, but it's outside, out, outside LA. And then we have a lot there in Texas. Texas is a big one, a lot of diverse habitat down there. And then you go to the southeast, we have a lot of southeast uh, grasslands. This is a more general, wider map. I'm looking at the southeastern United States. I'm going to focus in and make it more complicated for you right here. So, you know, we have coastal plains grasslands. Um, Piedmont is a big one uh, going up the Atlantic shore, shore, shoreboard. Um, oh, I'm trying to think what are some other ones I'm going to pick out of here. I don't want to pick out any more out of here. You can do that on your own later. And there's the Hempstead Plains of Long Island, right? We just talked about that one. So I'm going to go back and look at the Great Plains in, in the western part of the United States. This is generally the historical range again. Um, it's a little bit different than the other map um, that I showed you, but it doesn't matter. So this is technically, theoretically, what was. This is what's been taken away. Everything that's brown on this map has been converted from native landscapes, like native ecosystems. So in, in the east, that can be, it's probably more likely going to be uh, grasslands. Those are the first things to go, grasslands and meadows, because it's a lot easier to convert those into agricultural crops than it is to chop down a forest, right? It takes a lot, a lot less time, a lot less effort. 
All right, and here's what's remaining, at least according to a 2005 map, everything in the green, uh, pretty decent grassland prairie habitat. Okay, uh, you can see that strip in eastern Kansas, the Flint Hills. Uh, farmers had a hard time plowing that up because it's called the Flint Hills, so it's a little bit rocky. Uh, one quarter of Nebraska, where I'm talking to you from today, that's the Sand Hills. Uh, it's really hard to farm on sand. So, well, a lot of wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous, I mean, this should be a national park, those Sand Hills. Um, then you can see the green in the other areas, but it's a lot that's been converted. We have these acreages all over the place, right? These are three acre lots uh, behind where I live here in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And pretty much these acreages are just house, driveway, and a lot of lawn. So that lawn is taking up 2.5 acres or so, or, or more than that, right? Um, there on the left side in the middle is the Husker football stadium where they lose their football games, which is fine with me. I'm a Gophers fan, so no problem. Oh no, that screen is off center. I'm sorry, there might be a couple like that. Uh, we have 50% fewer birds than we did 40 years ago, okay? 230 North American bird species are at risk of extinction within decades. 96% of songbirds feed only insects to the young. Now that graphic on the right says, kids today see 35% fewer butterflies than their parents did 40 years ago. And this statistic is about a decade old at least. So the numbers are probably not going to be any better. Who are we gardening for? Who are our landscapes for, whether they're in urban or rural environments? Um, they're for us, yes, but they need to equally be for other species. That is a big question we have to ask ourselves. Who are we gardening for? Who are we stewarding and managing the space for? If it's just for us, what's the point? By 2050, over 70% of Americans are going to live in urban areas, places with greatly diminished green space. Of course, plants provide all kinds of ecosystem services. There's a small list. Views of complex nature increases the mental and physical health of school children, office workers, and hospital patients. There are studies that show the hospital patients that have a view of meadow or trees recover more quickly uh, from, what, from whatever is ailing them. Well-designed, diversified landscapes raise home values and spur community engagement while reducing crime. Uh, you want to read more about that, pick up my book, A New Garden Ethic. Uh, there's my friend Skilly on the left wearing, wearing their wonderful t-shirt. Of course, we have to throw in some Leopold today. We, you know, that the situation appears hopeless, he says, should not prevent us from doing our best. There's so much lawn out there. You know, we drive around and even if there's one area that's been converted, we celebrate it, but it's just a drop in the ocean, right? Um, hopefully that drop becomes something bigger, especially as more people see uh, converted and changed landscapes and start to see that as an acceptable way to do things because we all know, I, I know all of you are here, you, you understand this, right? These, these prairie meadow uh, urban landscapes that are replacing lawn are incredibly more beneficial. Um, the trick often comes in how do you manage that, teaching teams to manage that space, um, how much it costs to manage that space to compare to lawn. And we'll get into this stuff later on today. I'm getting ahead of myself, I do that a lot. So we need to go from spaces like this, the Nebraska State Capitol, if you want to know the nickname, we can talk about it uh, afterwards in the alley by the dumpster, but we need to go from spaces that look like this to spaces like this. We have a lot of these parking lot margins that are never ever gonna be used for anything. Nobody's gonna build an ice cream shop there. Uh, and, and the maintenance crews don't wanna be mowing on a 45 degree angle and tip over and kill themselves, right? So let's change that and have it look like this. Why do we need so much front yard? Let's go from this and go here, right? It's not that complicated. It's not that hard to manage the space. And again, we're gonna get into that. So let's talk a little bit about how we start designing these spaces. Uh, I not going to go into super depth um, with this today. That's for other presentations that are available on my website and on my YouTube channel if you're interested. But I'm going to give you a nice overview to get, get your feet wet, give you a good grounding, pun intended with the word grounding. All right. 
So there are a couple ways to remove lawn. That's where we all start, right? How do I get rid of that lawn so I can put in the sustainable native plant landscape that's gonna help wildlife and, and, and provide a cleaner environment for my family? There are four primarily, primary, primary methods. Uh, you can use whatever you want to do, okay? I'm not pushing, I, I might push one of these, but it'll get me into a lot of trouble. Um, but whatever works for you, okay? Just as long as you're converting that lawn. First method is sheet mulching. Uh, that's when you're putting newspaper or probably more more likely cardboard on top of the lawn. You're weighing it down with a little bit of topsoil or wood mulch or something. You moisten it up really well and you let it sit preferably for an entire growing season and then plant into it next year. Now, this is great if you got a couple hundred square feet and you have access to that, to enough of that cardboard to do this. However, if your space is, you know, we work at a lot of spaces that are 5,000, 10,000, 30,000 square feet in my business, and there's just not enough cardboard and it would take too long uh, to get that landscape converted in that way, especially when you're using seed. You can use solarizing, which is a method of putting plastic over the landscape uh, to basically fry and kill the weeds. So you put plastic on the space for about four weeks and then you take it off for two weeks and you let new weed seeds germinate and you put the plastic back on for four weeks and you take it off for two weeks and let hopefully the rest of the weed seeds germinate. And in that way, you're reducing the weed seed bank as, as you go through and methodically kill those weeds that you don't want on the site that can compete with your native plants, right? The drawback of this is the incredible amount of plastic waste you're producing. What are you gonna do with the plastic after that you're done using it. And then you're also frying soil life. You are literally killing the soil microorganisms. Sod cutter is another way to go. It makes it really quick. You know, you can cut the sod in the morning and install in the afternoon if you have enough crew, uh, enough friends over for beer and pizza, right? Uh, the downside of this is the CO2 and, and other noxious gases that are coming out. Um, you know, uh, lawnmower exhaust, uh, that lawnmowers are using gasoline that, that uh, leads to increased hypertension, reduces sperm counts, and, you know, sod cutter is going to, did he just say that? Yes, he did. Sod cutter is going to do the same exact thing, right? You're just adding to greenhouse gases in your urban area and our urban heat island effect. Then you also have to go rent the machine. You got to pull it on, a, put it on a trailer, strap it down, bring it home. Hopefully it works. We used the sod cutter once uh, in our life and the first machine broke down, the second machine broke down, we had to go rent a third one. And it was by, it was by the end of the day before we got the sod out of there. Uh, when you're pulling that sod off, you're exposing a, a big massive weed seed bank ready to germinate. Those seeds are in that soil at any level and once you take that sod off, the seeds are gonna have sunlight and moisture and just be like, yes, finally, we don't have to compete with the grass that's been on top of us. Uh, the final method is spray killing. So you do one or two treatments of a glyphosate-based product, and then you can just plant straight directly into the lawn. Reduces labor, reduces costs. If you have a bad back or bad knee, it's a good way to go. Just follow directions on the label. Uh, glyphosate-based products do not stay in the soil. Um, it's not a corn field. It's not a soybean field where people are spraying or farmers are spraying many, many times a month um, over decades and decades, and that certainly does kill the soil life. So the benefits of having leaving that dead lawn in place is that you're actually adding organic matter to the soil, okay? And again, no, we, we don't want site disturbance on landscape. So whatever you do, always think about how you can minimize site disturbance because whenever, whenever you turn over soil or expose soil to sunlight, you're exposing seeds to germinating and, and just having a good, good old time out there in your space. So here's one uh, that we did the application to in, in the sod. And we are planting forb plugs, flower plugs, and drifts through this space. Went in and then we sowed. So we had a budget constraint here. So we, we planted the flowers, right, in our masses and drifts. And then we sowed in Cytoats grama, Budalua curtipendula, watered that pretty well. A uh, year later, here you go. All right, so we have flowers coming up through the matrix or living green mulch or ground cover, cytoth grama, just like you'd see in a prairie or meadow space. And you know what? No matter where you live in the country, if you have a lawn, you have a prairie. You have a de facto prairie or, or meadow. It is ready to go, okay? All right, what is green mulch? I just mentioned that, didn't I? <laughs> so. Generally, and this is just very general, very broad, there's so many nuances to this based on ecoregion, site conditions and budget and all that stuff. But generally green mulch is one to three species that form a unifying green texture from which seasonal and sculptural plants, so think flowers, emerge throughout the entire growing season, spring through fall. Uh, okay. 
So some of the green mulch plants species we use, and these are generally one to two feet tall. Um, so they're, they're, they, they are like the ground cover layer, okay? Uh, for shade gardens, we're using sedge species. Those are the carrick species there uh, listed there. These are pretty adaptable. You can even use them in part sun, even to full sun conditions, especially if you have a little bit more consistent moisture. Carex albicans, Carex springgallii, Carex blanda, very adaptable as to site conditions. For sun, uh, we're going to be using, of course, sun-loving uh, grasses. And this is where short bunch grasses uh, come in. Uh, uh, so we have blue grama, blue gracilis, cytos grama, blue curtipendula, little blue stems, schizocarium scoparium, spirabilis heterolepis, uh, this prairie drop seed. Now I'm giving you the Latin and scientific uh, botanical names here today because that's actually making it easier for you. I know I have a lot of people always ask, oh, please give me the common names for, for, us, for us who are new to gardening. Uh, but if you do a search online with a common name, it, it could bring up three or four different species uh, native to all to portions across the entire world. So by giving you the Latin scientific name, I'm actually making it easier for you and being more helpful because you can more precisely find uh, the exact information you need, uh, hopefully reliably, uh, when you're using the Latin or scientific plant name. So just I, I know it feels overwhelming, um, but it is the most accurate way and it will save you a lot of time and a lot of headache. So here's a small bed underneath a river birch clump tree. This is Carex albicans. This is this is just a couple of months after planting. So the forbs, the flowers are not very big yet, but the Carex is doing very well. That's Carex albicans again. Uh, here's a small bed at a botanical garden. Uh, they have the blue grama in there, Budalua gracilis. Uh, and it's wonderful, right? It's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it just great looking? I just want to go in there and roll around in it, you know, rip your shirt off or something and go wild. Um, but what would make this space even better would be just to even have a couple forb species in here, maybe some pale purple coneflower or some prairie, uh, purple prairie clover or something. I know it's a, it's a very minimal modern aesthetic in this bed, um, but um, this is your base layer. So think of this, if you're doing your own garden, this is what you start out with. This is your matrix. This is your living green mulch. This is your main ground cover. And then you do the flowers coming up through there. So let's illustrate it with an image I stole from Thomas and Claudia's book, Planting in a Post Wild World. Um, if you're more on the advanced things, I think, uh, if you're more on the advanced side of things, this is definitely a good book for you. It's a little bit harder for beginners to read. Um, but this illustration is perfect. So it shows you the ground cover layer. That's where most of your plants are going to be. It's going to be where most of your biomass is going to be, where most of your plant material will be. And then you have your seasonal theme layer. So that's basically masses and drifts of flowers uh, that are blooming um, from spring through fall. And then you finally have a structural or architectural layer. These are just more scattered, individual, dotted, uh, taller species to the space. So think Joe Pieweed there, Eutrochium purpureum there on that top left. Or you might have a, a, a shrub or a small tree. Those will work as architectural structural layers. And when you have these different layers, you're providing a lot more habitat. You're providing a lot more stability to the landscape as well. It's a lot more climate resilience and weather resilience to the space. So when you're planting these, use plugs on 12 inch centers. I mean, why buy one gallon plants uh, that are $15? We can buy plugs that are a couple of bucks each. So no matter what plant tags say, no matter what your information says uh, online or in books, plant 12 inches apart because the goal is to cover the ground as soon as possible because you want to slow down erosion and you certainly want to have good weed competition. Nobody wants to be spending the first couple of years weeding their landscape. And if you plant thickly enough, AKA on 12 inch centers, uh, your weed pressure the second year is likely to be very, very low. Um, the first year can be a different ball of wax. It depends on your site conditions, what kind of weed pressure you had before, which is why it's important to get rid of the, those that weed seed bank before you even plant, if you know you're on a weedy site, right? Um, so yeah, density is key, right? And getting more bang for your buck, everybody wants to do that. Uh, don't go to a nursery and buy a thousand one gallon pots. Uh, you'll have to take out five mortgages on your house. Don't wanna do that. Um, you can do a 2.5 inch pot. Those are usually three to $5. You can get a plug tray. Those are usually in the neighborhood of 100 to $120. Where do you get plugs? Uh, if you're in the central or eastern United States, you can go to IZEL, I-Z-E-L. They work with native plant wholesalers um, and they will ship those plants out to you. You can buy any quantity or you can contact wholesalers directly. There are certainly a gazillion mom and pop native plant nurseries all over the United States who are gonna sell you probably 2.5 inch pots and they are everywhere. It just requires a little bit of internet searching.
So for my business, we are installing thousands of these plugs, those 2.5 inch pots and those 50 plug tray. We are installing thousands of those on one job site, okay? Um, we are not using shovels and we're not using knives. We are using uh, mixing drills. Uh, we use a three inch auger. That's, that's, I think our bits are 36 inches long and definitely three inches wide. You can use a standard home drill uh, with an auger bit like this, as long as you have loose, loamy, or sandy soil, okay? It's not going to work in a heavy clay, and I know a lot of us have clay. We certainly work in it all the time. You need a drill that is going to have lower RPM and higher torque, and that's, what a, that's where a mixing drill comes in. There are corded versions, and there are cordless versions. Obviously, the cordless ones are way more expensive, especially when you want to buy multiple battery packs uh, to, to make your day uh, go a little bit longer. Um, and if you are going to use a quarter version, make sure you're using like a 12 gauge cord. So the power from the, from the outlet is making it all the way to the drill. But you know, we just go bzz, and then somebody comes and plops in a plant. Bzz, somebody plops in a plant. And um, that makes it sound like it's really not hard. But you know, when it's a four or six hour uh, uh, job in blazing sun, it gets a little bit hot. So here's a garden uh, right after installation. These are pretty much on 12 to 15 inch centers in this landscape. So yeah, it doesn't look terribly sexy right after installation. Um, this lawn was spray killed. We did a one inch layer of mulch just to help us a little bit with uh, weed control the first year, conserve a little bit of soil moisture, and especially to look appealing to neighbors and appeasing to neighbors. Anytime you use wood mulch, um, it, the space automatically looks intentional, right? This was put here on purpose. Somebody just didn't vomit out a bag of seed or a bunch of plants and, and hope for the best. All right, so this is your matrix. You're planting on 12 inch centers. So you're using your sedge, you are using uh, your, your uh, warm season bunch grasses, doesn't matter. You're going 12 inches on center, okay? We usually do that layer second, but you can do it first if you want to. I don't care, I'm not there watching you. So here we go, we're massing and drifting species according to how they prefer to grow. Do they like to grow in communities? Do they like to grow singly? That's where research comes in helpful. But this is just to give you an idea of how we're doing this. We should actually probably use more flowers in this landscape. So this is a 100 square foot landscape, 10 by 10 feet. And I probably wanna double the flowers uh, in that space, but I wanted to make it really easy and illustrative for you. Massing and drifting is important in garden and natural garden design because it helps show intention to the space. Uh, whenever you go out to the wild prairie, I guarantee you, your eyes are going to focus in immediately on plant species that are massed and drifted landscape because your eyes are trying to make sense, make order, read the cacophony of all the wild plants out there, right? You're trying to understand the landscape. And the first way, primarily way, primarily a way we, 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 we do to find that order is, is to see that repetition. So you're going to see, you might see a big mass of ironweed, right? And then, oh, there's another one over there. And then, oh, there's another one over there. Okay, this landscape's starting to make sense to me now. I can visually uh, uh, create order through it, okay? And it's the same thing with a smaller natural type uh, garden that we have in our front yards or backyards. So there's an example of drift. There's an example of masses. Um, depending on how large your landscape is and what kind of plants you're using, your mass and drift counts um, will we'll differ as far as how many um, actual specimens you're using, how many plugs you're using. I hope that made sense. If it doesn't, there's the Q&A, right? So when you're uh, converting a front yard lawn into a more natural landscape, uh, it's we, we have a few general rules that we follow. Um, we're using shorter species. Most of our plants are around two to three feet tall. Uh, I try to keep a more average at two feet. Um, we might have a few things going three to four feet tall in there. Uh, we are definitely using behaved clumpers. So behaved species, species that don't spread very aggressively at all by seed or root runner. We are employing one green mulch layer, one green mulch matrix plant. So it'd be just a Carex albicans or just a Budalua gracilis to make it very simple, okay? Very easy to read and understand and make order from uh, for somebody who's walking their dog by on the sidewalk. We're gonna make sure they have a continuous bloom succession from spring through fall because flowers always show intention, right? Flowers say, oh yeah, this is a pretty space because flowers equal pretty, right? 
Uh, we will not have more than one to three species in bloom at once. And I think this is really important for smaller spaces, uh, a couple hundred square feet under a thousand square feet. So we don't want to overwhelm the space visually in any way. That's why we're using one matrix species, ground covered green mulch species, and why we're just going to have one to three flower forb species blooming at one time. Okay, we want to make it simple. We still have a, a enough support for pollinators flying by. Uh, for them. So, but we, we have to meet in the middle between humans and, and wildlife, especially in front yard landscapes, especially in lawn dominated suburban areas. We are paying attention to traditional landscape design methodology as well. Uh, some of that methodology talks uh, discusses um, having taller plants in the middle of a bed and taller plants in the back of the bed. So that's what we have here. We have our matrix green mulch of Budalua curtipendula. We have some calero and volucrata uh, weaving around on the ground plane a little bit. Most of the plants are going to be around two feet tall. There's Monarda bradbriana. There's some Coriopsis verticillata in there. But the taller species, the things that are going to get three feet, maybe four feet tall, if it's a really moist uh, growing season, it's going to be things like the Echinacea pallida and the Anemone virginiana. Even the Pycnathemum back there in the back can get tall in certain years. Uh, Pycnathemum tenuifolium is more drought tolerant than Pycnathemum um, virginiana. Stop giving me Latin plant names. Ah. Okay, something else to think about is sociability. And I don't think there's a lot of folks who ever heard of this concept. So it pleases me to bring it to you today. Uh, generally, um, plants can be ranked on a scale of one to, one to four based on how aggressive we expect them to be in a landscape. Now, aggressiveness, aggressiveness, aggressiveness can change based on soil type, um, based on how much moisture is in that soil, uh, based on whatever weather climatic pressures might be going on that time of year. Uh, so we'll have, so, you know, in a loamy soil, things might spread faster by roots. Uh, in a clay soil, they're going to spread a little bit more slowly. Uh, one of the poster childs for this is Conoclinium cholestinum, blue mist flower. You put it in a clay soil, especially with a lot of competition around it, plants placed 12 inches apart. Um, you put it in clay soil in full sun, it's going to be a lot slower moving around. It's just going to fill in the gaps among the matrix, uh, the gr ground layer uh, plants that you have out there. Put it in like a part sun, consistent moisture, loamy clay or loamy soil, and it's going to take over. Okay, that's just its nature. That's what it wants to do. So these are things you learn about through research and really that you just learn about through practice. Um, and, and that's okay. You're, this is a lifelong endeavor we're talking about here, right? It's just like raising kids, not so much like raising cats. Um, so the sociability scale, here we go. One behaved clumper, it's not really gonna go anywhere, okay? It's just gonna get a little bit bigger from a center. Uh, two is a light spreader. It might run a little bit by roots. You might see a few plants pop up here and there from seed, no big deal. So one and twos are definitely what you wanna have in a front yard lawn conversion. Now, it starts to get more aggressive with level three. Okay, these are plants that are definitely going to move around either by roots or seed, but they're not going to take over. They're not going to create a monoculture. They're still going to play with other plants, hopefully. Four, they are going to take over. Okay, so we probably don't want to have those in smaller landscapes. Examples for these species, ones would be things like uh, Hucra richardsonia, Baptisia minor. Two would be Echinacea pallida, Carex pensilvanica. Again, site, site um, conditions are going to change how these, how these species uh, grow, and certainly by ecoregion. Agastache funiculum, Symphotrichum lev, they're definitely getting more aggressive, so they're level three, but they're not going to go nuts. Uh, what are going to go nuts are Asclepias syriaca and Sorgastrum newton. Sorgastrum newtons is Indian grass, so that's a tall prairie grass. Most of our tall prairie grasses go crazy. Uh, you have a 500 square foot front yard you're converting. You don't want to have sorg you don't want to have Indian grass Sorgastrum newtons. You don't want to have big blue stem out there. Um, number one, they're just too tall. They're going to block sight lines. They're going to flop, um, but they're just going to take over, especially by seed, and you don't want that. The big message um, from thinking about plant characteristics is to plant, uh, to, to place like with like. So that means um, behaved, behaved plants with behaved plants, aggressive plants with aggressive plants. Um, there are designers out there who even in a small space, they will use all aggressive species because all those plants are gonna, all those aggressive species are basically just going to butt heads, right? They're just all gonna collide into one, into one another and sort of create a stable ecosystem. 
I don't have enough guts to try that myself. So I tend to stick with level one and level two and a few uh, level three plants on the sociability index. What that looks like, how you plan the landscape, that is up to you. Um, I personally don't use garden plans much anymore, um, but that's totally different. When you're starting out, I think it can be very helpful. So here's a plan where each dot will represent a certain amount uh, of plugs uh, based on the species. So like there's orange, AT, that's Asclepius tuberosa. I have seven groups of those throughout the landscape and they're in nine, they're in nine together. So nine uh, plugs per grouping, okay? That's one way to do it. I don't want to do every little dot on the landscape, but you can, you can do this. Uh, this is for an HOA approved landscape. Uh, that was 100% sand actually. So we're doing all kinds of different projects. So however you want to lay it out and it doesn't have to look this nice. Maybe you don't think this looks nice. That's okay too. You aren't not going to hurt my feelings. So here are a couple of uh, examples. I'm giving you lots of examples today, but there's so many ways to do this. You can go really wild, you can go semi-formal, you can even go um, decently formal if you want to. i am show you that one here in a second. But here's uh, Adam's uh, home landscape out on, uh, out, on, out on the East Coast. Um, so there's a lot of diversity here, a lot of plant selection, going, uh, succession going on through the season. So new plants are continuously coming on online. So the aesthetic show is really important here. There's just a lot of flowers, a lot of mass, but you can see the species all generally have the same height. So there's this uniformity that makes it, I think, feel a little bit more acceptable um, to people who might otherwise walk into the space and be like, wow, you know, I don't, that's a huge tall plant. And that's, you know, crazy over there. So Here's another design Adam did out in Missouri. Um, this is uh, quite a bit more uh, controlled, but this is certainly uh, earlier in the landscape uh, evolution uh, for the site, but it is a little bit more controlled. Here's a Phyto Studio planting with large masses and big sweeps of uh, Monarda Bradburyana, Bradbury's Monarda. Um, but see, it's very readable. It's just one species in flower. Um, there's probably a lot more in flower in the ground plane that you can't see, and they're providing a lot of ecosystem benefits um, that we don't know about. So you can really sneak a lot of plants, a lot more diversity into that ground layer because you can't see it from a long ways away. Uh, here's Kelly's garden out in Iowa. Um, again, just a different take. I would call this one a little bit more on the wilder side, but he's got a lot of mown paths uh, sneaking through the uh, space for access. Front yard at headquarters, uh, not enough blooms early in the season. I've been working on that slowly and slowly and slowly. Um, some of these species, uh, most of these species are, are, are behaved clumpers. Um, that Baptisia minor there, you can see in the top left is flanked by two Symphil trichome oblongifolium aromatic asters. Um, there's some rattlesnake master on the right. It's not going crazy for me. Some people say Oringia mucifolium rattlesnake master goes really crazy for them uh, towards the East Coast. Uh, I'm kind of jealous. I would love more seedlings. Client space again. I think I showed you this image before. There's that rattlesnake master on the left. Um, there's some mountain mint on the bottom right. Pycnanthemum virginianum, I think we used on that site. Uh, small business front yard uh, space. They were tired of the lawn. They were tired of all the crabgrass. And we certainly had crabgrass the, crabgrass the first year after installation, but it's just an annual weed, right? It's seed needs sunlight to germinate. So once you get plant competition in the space, a lot of those annuals like crabgrass uh, and foxtail just can't do anything. It just, there's just too much competition. Uh, so there's that space. A uh, long border, I think this is about 100 feet long and about eight feet deep uh, at a client space. So we're just massing and drifting in a matrix uh, green mulch primarily of little blue stem and side oats grama. Shade garden, so a lot of mature oak trees, very dark space here in this front yard landscape. So we used about five different sedge species, um, pretty much all the species I showed you on that earlier slide. And as we go in the fall, uh, the aesthetic show certainly does not end, right? There's a lot of texture, there's a lot of colors, not just flower colors, but brown is a color too. And a lot of cool goth type, you know, heavy metal black seed heads from Echinacea Palata. Boy, this guy's a nerd. He did, uh. All right, let's get deeper. All right, you've seen a lot of examples about what, the, what some of these natural landscapes can look like, okay? So why might weed control come 
why might neighbors be a little bit perturbed? Because I know we all want to think, hey, it's, it's my yard. I can do whatever I want to do, right? Why does it have to upset you? Um, that would be nice in a perfect world, but we don't live in a perfect world, as we all know too, too well, I'm sure. Um, so we have to meet people. We, we, we need to work with meeting people in the middle. And that's why earlier I talked about taller plants in the middle, taller plants in the black back, having only one to three species in bloom at one time, having one primarily matrix or green mulch ground cover, okay? And this does not reduce ecosystem function or your joy in the landscape. Trust me, I know this out of personal experience. So why might weed control come? Why might neighbors report you? Maybe your space looks like this, okay? Now I see a lot of beauty and I see a lot of ecosystem function here, but for a front yard landscape, this is a no-go. Uh, this is a wonderful, purposeful rain garden that is collecting uh, polluted water off of a nearby parking lot. Um, so its ecosystem benefits are through the roof. It is doing incredible good, but I would not put this in a front yard landscape. The plants are too tall, okay? Here we have a mass of what looks like probably Pacra aurea, golden ground cell, and it's just totally taking over, okay? Even though this is a bed with a manicured lawn space around it to show that it's intention, I mean, it is a garden bed after all, it still, I think, looks, you know, quote unquote, weedy, okay? We can, we can tweak this space. Here, it's an Asclepius syriaca show, right? This is a level four on the sociability index, so it's gonna take over. It's what it does. It's just its natural tendencies. Doesn't make it a bad plant, but it's gonna take over. Evening primrose in a hell strip. You don't wanna park on this street and be the passenger of a car opening your door and walking out into the primrose and the primrose, you know, it attacks you and it takes you down into the ground and buries you. It doesn't do that. Uh, so we have some hell strips uh, in, in my city that it's great to see them planted with different species. Um, and I know it, it takes a big management budget and a lot of know-how to manage these spaces effectively. Um, but there's a lot of cacophony in, this, in, in these spaces as well. Sometimes guard designers make mistakes. And we, so we did this front yard. And I think the issue when I look at this space is, again, there's not enough early season blooming, uh, May into June, that there's two shoulder seasons where I think we tend to not have enough flowers. That's that May to June period, and then late August into early September. And there are species to solve the issue. But there's not enough massing and drifting here either. There's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of cool things that are going on. Um, but there's just not enough design design in it. Yeah, that's what the pros say. We're all having coffee at the coffee house. There's not enough design design. But this landscape is totally fine, right? You know, are all the plants in a firing line? I guarantee you that every year a bunch of pre-emergent herbicide is put down and then another five inches of, of wood mulch. And there you go. You're done for the year with maintenance. It's easy. I guess it's cost effective. Um, but man, there's no benefit to this landscape at all. So why is weed control gonna come? Uh, your plants are too tall or they're too aggressive. So you're, you're, you're getting that theme here today, aren't you? Plants are impeding pedestrians or traffic. If you have a corner lot, you don't wanna have a bunch of tall species right on the corner and cars can't see what other cars are coming from a 90 degree angle, that's bad news. Plants are causing a physical hazard to structures. Maybe a tree was planted too, too close to something. No cues to care. We'll get to that in a second. You might even have an invasive species present and you're not actively managing or managing enough the landscape. A musk thistle is a big one that just pops up all the time. That's an, it's on the invasive species list, a noxious weed list. County's going to come after you for that. So you they they've come they've come a knocking okay uh, as wildlife gardeners as, as people advocating for what I see essentially as social social justice for wildlife if not for ourselves because we're working on cleaning the environment and creating a safer uh, environment for ourselves you know you're passionate about this right and it's really easy to get emotional and angry about it ask me how I know um, but it's really critical not to sound angry or accusatory uh, whenever you do get letters or whenever you speak to an inspector or a neighbor in person. Try to be professional and calm and at least sound like you're open to compromise and that you're absolutely 100% willing to hear the other party's perspective on the landscape, okay? Because you want to convey this idea that you're, you want to meet in the middle and work with them. This is like, right, this is like family counseling, okay? Know the binomial nomenclature scientific name. Again, I know we just want to use common names, 
but something magical happens when you spout off Latin plant names to people. They're like, oh, you know your stuff. Okay, maybe I should think about this in a little different way, or maybe you know what you're doing, okay? Uh, have a list on paper of all the plants that are in your landscape. Have it ready to go so that you can give them to whatever uh, official you need to give them to that shows that, hey, all this stuff, it's purposeful, intentional. I know why it's here. I know why I put it there. Uh, I know what it's doing, okay? Know which pollinator species are using what plant species. If you're a habitat gardener, I think this is pretty crucial, okay? so. So whatever is using side oats ground, whatever's using grass, whatever's hosting on the milkweed, whatever's hosting on the asters, whatever's hosting on the red beckia, okay, just, just know it. Um, it's, it's good for you to know it anyway. Be able to cite scientific studies, just, you know, right at the top, you know, off the top of your head to show the benefits of these, of these sort of natural meadow type plantings and the ecosystem services, like, again, stormwater runoff, cleaning and cooling the air. Uh, yeah, all that good stuff. If anything, you can just say, look, this is exciting and thrilling. You know, I'm breeding these super monarch caterpillars to get like 15 feet long in my landscape. Isn't this awesome? I have been told uh, by my local weed superintendent that the letter of law is written to be vague and open to interpretation by weed inspectors. And that's for a very good reason, according to them. It's, thought, it's not there to infuriate wildlife, uh, natural landscape gardeners, um, even if we all agree that there needs to be better guidelines. The vagueness is there specifically to give leeway to officials to make case by case decisions. But those decisions are not going to go well unless you ask for a re for a review or explanation of your property. Even then, you still might lose. I've I've been telling more and more clients now. You know, everybody's coming to me pretty much anymore and saying, "I want my front yard gone, and I want what you do. I want these pictures of a designed meadow space." And so I've been telling more and more clients now, you have to be ready, at least for the first year or two, maybe three, that there's going to be neighbors who don't understand this space and that are just going to be naturally emotional and defensive about it. And this is totally normal. It's human psychology 101. Whenever, whenever somebody steps out of the herd mentality, um, the herd is going to be like, whoa, you know, come back in. You got to fit, you got to fit back into this, into the, to this puzzle here. Uh, so we just have to be ready. It it does not happen very often. I say about two out of every 100 landscapes uh, where there's an issue and it tends not to last very long. So just be ready for that. I think the easiest thing is planning, designing, installing, and even paying for the landscape. Um, I think at times the hardest thing can be willing to advocate uh, for the landscape and, 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 and you know just be that activist, be that open and considerate activists, activists, which is cer certainly hard for me because I just, you know, again, I'm pissed off prairie guy. I'm driving around town and I don't get it. Makes me crazy. So the process of being cited is likely to occur in this order, no matter where you live. A neighbor, a neighbor is going to report you to an online system, which keeps them anonymous to you, uh, which is which is good. Unless you like to give beer to your neighbors, then it's not good. Uh, weed Control sends out a part-time summer employee who probably doesn't know that much about plants or horticulture in general. They're just automatically posting a notice uh, to your door or doing or staking a notice into your into your uh, garden space, uh, taking a quick uh, picture and getting back in their car and going on to the next site. Ask me how I security camera know this. You are also likely to get a letter in the mail. All right, so they're going to double dip with you. You have a set period of time to remove or mow down the site of vegetation or face a penalty. And these and these letters are worded very strictly for a reason, right? They want you to to kowtow, to be afraid, to do what they tell you to do. Uh, so there is an uh, example, one letter uh, that you might get in the mail. This is an example of sign you might get uh, put in there. You are required to cut and remove weeds and worthless vegetation, which has got to be one of my favorite favorite phrases on the entire. It's like I need a tattoo, worthless vegetation. What the heck does that mean, right? Anybody can say something is worthless, okay? I mean, what is a weed? What is a nuisance? These are all words that you're going to see in these letters and signs. What is worthless vegetation? Why does it have to be cut that back to, cut back to six inches? Why is six inches magical? Especially when a lot of our neighbors are mowing their lawns really short, way too short, two or three inches tall, when it should be four to six inches tall. So there's, there's greater uh, weed suppression and increased soil moisture in the landscapes. 
told you this was a big talk today, didn't I? I'm barely halfway through. <laughs> All right, so depends on, okay, so are dandelions weeds? I think this is a big one and I sort of, it's sort of a uh, tributary to everything we're talking about here today. Because uh, dandelions are a poster child for a lot of issues. I mean, the first time I was reported here at headquarters, it was for about 10 dandelions that developed seed heads in the front lawn. A um, little bit crazy. So they are, so the, we have basically have the exotic species from Europe. From Europe, there's your scientific name uh, that was imported as a food crop by colonists, right? Salads. It's now a naturalized species, no amount of poison, and we shouldn't be using it any way to treat dandelions. No, way to po no amount of poison or, or, or chemicals is ever going to get rid of these species of cats out of the bag. However, I think there are some benefits to it. I know a lot of people eat them. Go crazy, man. We got, we got trillions of these, so you're going to be full. Um, there are benefits. The basil rosette makes a nice ground cover to mitigate other, mitigate other weed seed germination. So it can act as a very beneficial ground cover uh, matrix tile or part of a matrix uh, garden plant. It's not the first flower to bloom, though. I hear this one a lot, and it's certainly not the best option if you're trying to support uh, as much fauna as, as possible, especially pollinators like, like moths and butterflies and, and bees and beetles and all kinds of bugs, okay, uh, because uh, this non-native exotic dandelion is not a host to anything. So there's lots of other woody perennial ephemeral species that are blooming before, during, and just after, after the bloom time of this non-native dandelion species. So here's a very, very partial list uh, that I came up with uh, with my friend, uh, Heather Holm. So you can pause this in the recording later on or take a very quick picture with your cell phone. You have five seconds, four, three, too late. Uh, here's some woodland perennials and ephemerals. There's a uh, geranium, wild geranium there on the left, geranium maculatum. So geranium maculatum is a fun one because you can put that pretty much anywhere, sun or shade, right? And it acts as another ground cover matrix style plant. You can put it in among sedges and grasses, just tuck it in anywhere. What is an invasive plant? Uh, this is something <laughs> we, 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 we throw around these terms all the time and I feel like we don't really know them. So invasive is an exotic species that alters the landscape uh, to suit its specific needs, its hold, or its its growth conditions, often to the detriment of others, uh, uh, and often creating a monoculture. We don't want monocultures, okay? Uh, Cornfields are not beneficial. A loss of biodiversity and ecosystem function soon follows because it's created a monoculture to favor itself. Aggressive plant is totally different. It can be a native or exotic species, but we often uh, we often think of uh, uh, of aggressive species as being native plant species, and it takes advantage of an opening in its niche to establish. Uh, well, often, an aggressive plant is an early succession plant whose role is to heal and stabilize the landscape and may diminish over time uh, via natural competition. So I'm thinking of plants like Rebecca herta, black-eyed Susan, that tends to be a biennial. Uh, it will take over easily by self-sowing the first two or three years, but as long as you plant it on 12 inch centers with all of your other species, it will slowly diminish and even fade out. Um, early, other early succession species that people plant, treating them as thinking they're going to be long-term perennials and wonder why they die or flop over or look or otherwise weak, uh, are going to be things like uh, Monarda fistulosa. Um, so that purple bee balm that usually gets three or four feet tall. Uh, what's the other one? Retibita pinata, gray-headed coneflower, is often treated as a long-term. You know, these are early succession species that have evolved to just be around for a couple of years. They're just healing and covering the landscape for the first couple of years until all their friends can come in and take over. Okay. Uh, in some ways, Canadian goldenrod does that. Um, so we have two aggressive species here, Canadian goldenrod, Saladago canadensis, and then we have a native, probably, this is probably tall thistle. Um, we have native thistles. They are incredibly beneficial. Every time you see a thistle, it doesn't mean it's an exotic, nasty thing you need to dig out of the ground. Usually native thistles, when you turn the leaf over, it's a silver, very bright silver underleaf. Things like musk thistle, Canada thistle, um, they're gonna be a, a, a green color on the bottom. So this is not a foolproof way to figure this out, but it's generally generally a pretty good, good way to go. Now, we do our invasive, invasive noxious weed list here in Lancaster County in eastern Nebraska is this. You don't want these growing in your landscape. Make sure that if they pop up, you get rid of them. 
our biggest issues are usually musk thistle. I'm trying to think anything else. There's a little bit of leafy spurge in the prairie near us, but it's not our prairie. So um, yeah, da, 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 that's probably the biggest one. Uh, frankly, red, eastern red cedar um, is a big issue. It's a native plant, but it takes over. This is why we're losing. This is one of the reasons why we're losing uh, so many uh, uh, of our grassland ecosystems. Grassland nesting birds don't like tall structures, tall trees. Um, they like everything flat, so they can see, so no predators can perch in a tall tree or a pole or something like that. So when eastern red cedars start to invade grasslands and prairies first thing to suffer are going to be grassland bird species. That's one of the reasons why we're, they're one of the most threatened groups of bird, species, uh, bird groups in the world. Now, my county also encourages, they do encourage prairie plantings on their website, uh, and, but also the use of natives that are resistant to the pre and post emergent herbicide called plateau in order to keep weeds down. So they suggest an annual early spring application of this pre emergent herbicide. Of course, this means that new seedlings are going to be killed, okay, and then seedlings that could otherwise help fill the garden layers and outcompete a bunch of other weed species, including those on the noxious weed weed species list. We want our gardens to fill in. We want them to self sow. We want them to be dynamic and spread and find their way and teach us what they want. Having a heavy hand in the landscape means that the garden cannot do what it needs to do and provide as many benefits uh, as it can. Suggested species by the county are these. So as a garden designer, as somebody thinking about all the ecological niches, um, all the succession that goes on from season to season and year to year, I look at this list and realize I cannot create a healthy, successful, dynamic, resilient, stable landscape with just this species list. It, it, they don't work together. Only a couple of them maybe do. Um, so when you see, when you, you might have lists like this in your own county, so they need to be augmented. Help neighbors and passersby and inspectors see your space as purposeful. Please do this work. It starts with the bones. It starts with the hardscapes. And certainly it starts with plant selection. Again, habit, reproduction, sociability, bloom sequence, even winter form. What's it going to look like in winter? Don't cut those gardens down in fall. They are magical in the wintertime and still have a lot of ecosystem function and purpose. This is where we get into cues to care. Have wide walking paths to your landscape, not paths that are six, six inches wide and you can barely snake through. That's weedy, that's overrun, that's messy. Whether we like to think of that or not, that's the truth of the matter when we're trying to meet people in the middle with natural landscapes. Have objects in your landscape that show intention and human use, like benches, sculptures, arbors, bird baths, signs. You know, earlier I talked to you about when we're walking in a prairie, our eyes are automatically going to try and focus on groupings and masses and drifts of plant species to try and find order and read the, uh, the landscape and make sense of it. Okay, this is exactly what benches and sculptures do. They help the eye rest and focus on the space, see it as intentional. So I have a six foot wide walking path going through the middle of two wilder beds. It says, welcome, come on in. This is for you too. Not the band, uh, people, okay. Uh, here's a client landscape where we took care of the lawn areas that we were gonna plant into, um, but we left a four foot wide lawn walking path going through the space. So this is a tall fescue um, that we're primarily working with out here in Eastern Nebraska. Here's, we're about done with the planting. So we did a mulch, one inch mulch layer and then planting 12 or 12 to 15 inches through that space. Here's a client's shade garden. They did this path themselves. Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't it wonderful? Nice, a uh, lot of different textures with the metal edging and the stone pathway. And then, so this is a shade garden. So it's primarily a Carex or sedge matrix green mulch ground cover with lots of different masses and drifts of woodland forbs and woodland edge forbs flowers. Stone path, client put this one in too. Simple cues to cue to care, okay? Going right through um, the sedge in the shady urban landscape. I love sedge meadows. I love it when people say, I've got a shady space. I know I can't have anything pretty. I know I can't have a meadow or prairie type. And I'm like, gosh, here's that. I got 20 plants right here in my back pocket I got ready for you. Stone walls are cues to care. So this goes, this goes into thinking about hardscapes, the bones of the landscape. 
arbors, fountains. Fountains are good for birds. Just make sure you keep them clean. Sculptures by local artists. Support your local artists and pick up something. Make a bench, a nice Aldo Leop uh, uh, Leopold bench works. Uh, have sitting areas. Again, you can use sitting areas and lawn for, uh, in, in multiple ways. Fall is pretty, brown is a color. Winter is pretty even without the snow, especially when you have lots of plants in the space. I don't know, even dead lawn is nice. I mean, dead lawn is gonna come back. Actually, dead, dead lawn is really nice. You can make it more formal. You can think more French parterre. So you can have exotic boxwoods uh, framing a more wilder planting bed in the middle. This is my friend's uh, Nick's, uh, one of his projects out in Ohio. Signs are big. My local weed superintendent said when there are signs in the landscape, they have a lot fewer issues with neighbors uh, re reporting these spaces. Uh, this is a project we did at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. They put out a lovely sign. It must have cost a small fortune. Uh, it, it was just perfect, just enough words. It's a pretty big sign uh, and, and some wonderful little pointers about what specific species are using what specific plants. So people can watch for those and engage and, and educate themselves in the landscape. Uh, you know, any kind of sign works. There's so many, so many signs out there to use. I created some myself here uh, that you can print up and, and, and have at your own, uh, have, have made at your own sign shop or whatever. Hey, even for Halloween, we can get into the act, right? RIP lawn, you know, there's my friend Skelly out there again, making an appearance. So I showed you these images earlier of landscapes that most neighbors are gonna walk by and call weedy and messy. So how can we address them as garden designers who still wanna have a lot of ecosystem function and support as much wildlife as we possibly can? Well here, this, this homeowner is definitely, definitely a passionate about supporting monarch butterflies because they're using milkweed, which monarchs, you know, they lay their eggs on milkweed. That's where the caterpillars come from. Well, instead of doing Asclepias syriaca, common milkweed, let's use Asclepias tuber tuberosa, orange butterfly weed, which is a much shorter species. And then while we're at it, we can diversify the landscape, have some green mulch, maybe some Budula gracilis in there, um, have a couple different forbs blooming throughout the season. So we're supporting monarchs and other adult pollinators, uh, not just just in one part of the season, but throughout the entire growing season. So it's a small space. We'll have to keep our species list small, um, but still having just five different species um, is a lot more beneficial than just one monoculture of very aggressive uh, common milkweed. Evening primrose, it's gotta go. If you're planting a hell strip, think about species that are 12 inches or less and love to be peed on or stepped on or pooped on or whatever. So again, something like a Budula gracilis, that's gonna keep it short. Maybe use some sedge species uh, if it's a shady site. Uh, but again, under 12 inches, maybe you just stick it, do, keep it down to six inches. So do this landscape, again, it's going to be I think wider paths would be helpful and definitely more flowers in that first shoulder season of late spring to early summer. Okay, here's another client landscape. This one's coming along, it's taken slow, slow to build, but it's on an acreage lot. Uh, we did a big deep, like 50 foot deep border on the backside and they still have a lot of lawn. So, but they, they did take a lot of it out. So we still have a lot of good things going in the space. Nobody is saying get rid of all of your lawn. Yeah, yeah, we are. No, <laughs> you don't have to get rid of all of it. Okay, uh, you can have you can use lawn as walking pathways. I think that's one of the best ways to use lawn. They can be wide paths or shorter paths. Generally, we generally we like to go with at least three feet wide. More cues to care, right? Even a tree can be a cue to care. There's a maple tree. You know, lamp post in front of your house, lamp post can be a cue to care. Uh, even just a piece of Corten steel uh, slammed out into the ground uh, can work as a space for the eye just to rest and focus and read and see order in the landscape. There's another shot of the two different pieces of metal in this one. Winter is beautiful, winter is purposeful. I know everybody right now is watching this. It's March and people are thinking no more winter, uncle. And I'm thinking, gosh, didn't have enough snow this year. Hey, put a light in some of these sculptures, especially in the winter. Turn it off in spring though, because that's gonna mess with moths going around and pollinating plants. Speaking of spring, 
you're going to see this meme around a lot. It says, wait until temperatures are consistently 50 degrees Fahrenheit daytime in your landscape. Uh, and I 90% I, I vehemently disagree with this meme. So let's get into it. It's not about air temperature when you clean up your landscape. Various fauna, you know, bees, butterflies, spiders, whatever, they wake up at different times throughout the growing season. Sure, most of them are gonna be waking up in spring and early summer, but there are some who don't emerge until later. Many, need, made, many native bees are going to time their life cycle around specific genera or even species of flowering plants. So when those flowers bloom, that's when they come to get pollen because they rely on the pollen of specific plant species, specific plant genera. Um, so they're not going to be out and about until the until their internal clock says, hey, Monarda is booming right now. Wake up, get out there and get, get your reproduction on. You don't want to walk in any of your beds at any time if you can help it, especially in the spring, because you may be crushing queen bumblebees hiding uh, or overwintering just underneath the leaf litter, adult morning cloak butterflies, amphibians, beetles, bugs, spiders, all kinds of stuff. Plus, you could be compacting wet spring soils, and you certainly don't want to be doing that. But really the big question here is, do you really have to clean up? What are the goals of cleaning up? Uh, you should have goals. If you're just out there cleaning up because you're feeling itchy because it's a nice 60 degree day outside, uh, rethink that, okay? Your goals could be any one of the following. These are primarily ones, removing diseased material, helping sunlight reach soil for seed germination. So if you have a lot of ground cover, maybe a lot of grass and you wanna have some more flowers and you know the flower seeds are out there, you're gonna cut back that grass really low, maybe even rake it up a little bit so that sunlight is hitting bare soil where those flower seeds are and can germinate. You probably also wanna be tidying up your front yard to appease neighbors. So if you have a front yard space, uh, show that you're actively managing it, that it's an intentional space that you're tending to it and there's purpose to it and you didn't just let it go. Uh, different spaces in your landscape will require different management, different times of year, different years even. Our back meadow at headquarters, we tend to just mow most of it down. We sometimes rotate mowed areas. One year we'll mow this spot, one year we'll mow that spot. Um, but in front beds, we'll cut it down, we'll mow this space, and another 1,500 square foot bed, we pretty much don't do anything. We just let it do its own thing. Now, if you want to support the 25% of native bee species that nest in cavities and use stems in particular, flower stems, here's a wonderful chart that uh, Colleen, Elaine, Heather, and Sarah put together. It shows you exactly uh, when to cut back plants, how to cut them back, how long to leave them. So if you cut back your plants and you leave 12 inches of stem this year because you know you're gonna have some native bees nesting in that pith or that hollow stem, you're cutting those plants back 12 inches this year. Don't cut them back next year because those plants are full of, of larva and adult bees that are gonna be coming out this year. So you're basically leaving stems for two years. You can leave them forever, right? They're gonna naturally decompose, decay anyway, and new growth in the spring is gonna shoot up really fast and cover and hide all that stuff if you are just really scared of seeing 12 inch tall uh, brown stalks in your landscape. And I'm not a fan of No Mo May. That's coming up. Uh, well, it comes up every year, doesn't it? Go figure. It's going to look weedy fast when you just stop mowing your lawn. Without design intention, your neighbors are going to be less apt to get on board. There are invasive species that I guarantee you are going to germinate and establish when you just stop mowing. I mean, what's in the weed seed bank? What's in that soil? You don't know. Could be some native plants. They could be aggressive self sowers like smooth aster. There's definitely going to be ex exotic, ex aggressive species in there. They might be invasive. Or they might just be annuals. You don't know. Uh, you need, again, this is all about intention, especially in front yards. It's about massing and drifting. It's about controlled heights. It's about cues to care. It's about having wide pathways. It's about having a sign and helping people learn and accept and interpret these wilder landscapes. If we're not doing that, I don't know why we're doing this at all. So if you let your lawn go, think hard about management, about a management plan that takes into consideration your ecoregion, your zip code, um, and your lot size, as well as your environmental and community goals. And know your plants as they come up. If you stop mowing and you don't know what plants are coming up, then you're not, this is not, this is not intentional. You're just throwing caution to the wind, okay? That's not gonna win anybody over. And it's not gonna help you educate or be empowered about the landscape, about what you're doing. Basically, 
this is why this is in bold here. If we're not working smartly with a plan and a goal, then we're just being lazy and ideologically polarizing for absolutely no reason. That's not helpful and it's not neighborly. At the same time, kids don't need lawn, right? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of two sides of the co coin here. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people will tell me, well, where are the kids gonna play? And I'm gonna like, be like, oh, right there, you know? Uh, we've got a four-year-old son and he's out there all the time creating stems and petals and making potions and Frisbee discs. I'm sorry, novelty flying discs. Uh, we're out there playing hide and seek all the time. There's so many wonderful creative adventures and he's getting a lot of good beneficial microbes on his skin that are hopefully gonna make him more resilient to developing allergies. Yes, there are scientific studies on that. I told you this was a long talk. Not many people have left. You're probably all in the bathroom and I don't even know it. Oh, you're probably in the bathroom with your, uh, with your, with your phone in your lap. I don't wanna know, don't tell me. All right, I'm going to give you very candid, very pointed advice now on how to work with HOAs if you live in an HOA, especially a more restrictive and militant HOA. So first, a plant list with scientific and common names should be, so you're gonna bring all this material together. You're gonna to make a presentation to the HOA, hoping that they're gonna approve your plan. So what are you gonna to bring to that board meeting? You're going to bring a plant list with scientific and common names, including images of every plant you're gonna use. You're gonna have a table, a wonderful spreadsheet, a table of bloom times, color, anticipated mature size, a table of plant sociability. Example, example you're not using a bunch of aggressive species that are gonna take over and make it look weedy. Images of inspirational gardeners by landscape designers that you hope to emulate. I mean, obviously it won't look like that, but you know, you're striving here, right? You have a goal. The specific wildlife benefits of each plant, right? You could say something like, as you all probably know, monarch populations are down X percent in our region, or the loss of pollinators like bees has been in the news a lot lately. And these specific plants here are gonna support these specific bees that are really important for these specific reasons. Uh, it's, yeah, spend the time doing this. It's really important and it works. I have experience. Uh, you could give them an inspirational image like this. Um, this is this is perfect for a large space, but I think in a smaller space, the drifts are gonna be smaller, right? It's all about scale. Uh, six point, uh, the specific neighborhood benefits of this type of landscape, right? Trees that shade hard surfaces like streets and roofs that will decrease surface and air temperatures by eight, X percent. Um, thick layered gardens reduce storm runoff. If you have, uh, you know, with climate change, we have heavier rains. We get three inches in 10 minutes, it feels like sometimes. Um, those storm drains are going to become quickly overwhelmed and people's homes and businesses could be flooded. And that's not cool at all. So we need to keep more water on site and help it penetrate into the soil. Uh, less, less fertilizer use, less herbicide use, less noise pollution, less air pollution when you don't have to be constantly mowing all the time. Look at those cues to care there, right? You have, and you can see the layers. You've got the architectural, structural, uh, large shrubs, small tree, um, wide paths, beautiful. You're gonna present a planting plan to your HOA, even if you have to hire a designer to make it. You're gonna have a detailed management plan season by season and year to year. Your design is gonna include obvious spots for mother cues to care like benches and tables and you know uh, apple firing Gatlin guns or something for the Halloween season. Signatures of neighbors who approve your plan, uh, awareness of local weed ordinances. See, I know what's weedy and invasive. I'm not gonna have any of that stuff here. Uh, maybe even get approval by the plan or the city weed superintendent to give you an extra little, you know, uh. Now you're going to hear about this a lot because uh, this is in, in weed county laws. This is in the verbiage. What about snakes, rodents, and fires? Uh, well, out here by me, we basically just have garter snakes. Um, I love it when they eat voles and mice. They're wonderful, beneficial uh, predator to have around. If you have venomous snakes in your area, it behooves you to understand what species those are and what kind of habitats they like and not to reproduce those habitats, especially close to an area where you're sitting or having a campfire. Actually, they might not even come close to the campfire, right? Rodents, people usually mean to say rats that are carrying bubonic plague. Um, well, okay. <laughs> rats prefer cheeseburgers, so please don't throw cheeseburgers out into your garden. They're not seeking, uh, they're not seeking flower seed. 
Fire is a big one, fire concerns. Uh, prairie grasses do tend to burn pretty quickly. So a good strategy is to incorporate wide lawn and mulch paths that can work as fire breaks, but they're also cues to care right, and then remove thatch and making sure you cut down the garden every spring. If you do live in a fire prone area, then of course, plan and design your landscape accordingly. Maybe you have 20 feet of lawn or gravel or whatever between your house and a wilder planting. Maybe it has to be 50 feet, I don't know. Um, but yeah, you need to be aware of that. Ticks is a really big topic, especially with climate change. We have more ticks, we have more tick-borne diseases. It's just unavoidable with climate change. However, wide walking paths are really beneficial. This is why six feet wide paths is good because ticks are out there on the edge of plants with their front legs out like this, questing, that's what it's called, they're questing, that they're reaching for anything that's gonna walk by so they can hitch a ride. Um, so that's how six foot wide paths can help us. Uh, we also want diverse habitat, actually. Monoculture is bad. We want diverse habitats uh, that increases tick predators and predators of disease vector species like white-footed mice. That's where uh, that's where Lyme disease comes from. So a tick goes on a, a white-footed mice, gets Lyme disease. Um, but if we don't have foxes and owls and they need lots of habitat, lots of dense, diverse habitat that we don't see in suburban areas, if we don't have these predators, we're going to have greater tick problems. Of course, nothing replaces spraying, tucking your pants in, checking yourselves. Um, fire is actually a good management tool if you can burn your landscape. So the, but overall, the benefits of a naturally designed garden are going to far, far, far outweigh the drawbacks. There's a cute fox. Doesn't everybody want a fox in their landscape? I'm going to go through these next slides as we get close to the end fairly quickly. Uh, you can pause these or take quick pictures uh, with your phones or your kid's camera. But these are just links uh, to legal precedents, um, legal victories where people actually uh, you know, went into the courtroom, um, as well as cities that have changed their municipal codes. Uh, so yeah, there's that one in Chicago, uh, Maryland couple. That, that, that's been all over the place. Um, relatives of the writer and activist Nancy Lawson. That one's on the bottom. What do I want to say about these? Eh, it's just two more. I always people always say, well, where do you where do you find this information? So I'm trying to put it together in one one easy ish spot for you. Uh, so that one in Florida is really good. The Model Native Plant Landscape Ordinance. Um, Florida is actually pretty progressive about this stuff. You wouldn't expect that. Uh, if it, I don't know if it actually happens, but there's a big native plant community down in Florida. Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota code has been changed. Uh, Stanford, Connecticut. Yep. Uh, they're doing, da, da, da. and then a lot of links there on that bottom with the National Wildlife Federation. We had Green Bay working on their setback requirements there on the bottom. This one is really, really, really cool. Field, Field Museum source book on natural landscape for local officials. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Certainly still applies, and it is a good length too. A lot of information there. So what I'm saying to you guys, and I know that's why you're here, is we have to rethink pretty. It's not just pretty about us or for landscape systems um, that the dominant culture has created in just the last 70 years. If we're going to maintain our health and the health and longevity of this planet, we have to rethink pretty. Uh, it's not just lawns. We have to rethink pretty in our suburban areas. This is what we're up against, right? This is that homegrown national park business going. Um, if even just a couple of these landscapes were, were wilder and less monoculture, um, it would help species have habitat corridors and find more resources. If you have a rob robot lawnmower, you know you have a lawn addiction. We can do this. We can garden. Who are we gardening for? It's not just for ourselves, right? The sun really is setting on the American lawn, whether we know it or not. It really, it's happening. It's slow and it feels like it's never going to happen, but you know, that snowball's going down the hill. So my encouragement is the choice is yours when it comes to implementing more natural landscape versus fitting in with the dominant monoculture. It's easier to find a way not to do something, especially when doing it means we expose ourselves to criticism and conflict, but doing nothing is, is often the worst alternative of all. The reward is always going to be equal to the risk. I need to tell, my that, tell myself that much more often. We need more examples of a healthier way forward and that's where you all come in. You are the change. Remember, I stand in solidarity with you. I, I mean, I stand in solidago with you, okay? We're in this together.
If you want to go so much more deeper, and I hope you do, I hope you will consider picking up a new garden ethic. This is the philosophical treatise, right? It's uh, I've had I've had design friends tell me it's a hand grenade th hand, hand grenade thrown in the room because it it destabilizes so much about traditional horticulture. Uh, Prairie Up tells you how to do this. It is for beginners. It is an introduction. It is incredibly accessible. It takes you step by step through uh, through everything we talked about today in great detail. And my press is offering 30% discount on this when you go to the University of Illinois Press website. Enter that coupon code. And you know what? If you are you ready to unlaw unlaw America? Are you ready to save yourself time? Gosh, I know you are. Are you ready to get that garden ecosystem thriving? Okay. I've got 18 online video classes at my website, uh, starting your native plant garden, green mulching matrix design 101, to showing you exactly how to do matrix design, uh, gardening in the shade with sedge plugs. I've got a lot of PDF pocket guides to help you uh, to, to make things easily digestible. You literally pull them out of your pocket, okay? These are two page documents. And I will even work with you on a self-paced workshop as you create your own garden design plan to learn these concepts. This is like, so if you really, really want to go deep, I'm here to work with you. And I'm absolutely going to do something special here today and get and provide 30% off on all of this stuff. I hope you'll take advantage of it. Mm -hmm.